What's going on guys, this is Stigward, and today we'll be talking about two bugs I found and reported last month in the open source video game, Free Droid RPG. More broadly though, we're going to be talking about a skill that has personally helped me to level up my Vuln research game. The skill in question is called bug spotting, and I first came across this idea in a talk given by Ned Williamson of Google Project Zero back in 2018. Approach this with the mindset of there's this arbitrary skill I want to learn, and if I approach it strategically, like what's going to happen? I kind of have this training idea where essentially try to enumerate all the existing bug reports, look through each of them, and then this it's this like Ben Franklin idea. Like you take the bug, and then you look at usually there will be like you know this block of text, and they're mentioning like the file where it's happening and stuff, and and so then you go over and you try to find it yourself, and when you've given up essentially, then you look at you know what was the bug through that struggle. It's usually pretty clear like what was the fundamental thing you were missing. The concept is simple. Just like you do reps at the gym to get stronger, you need to do reps of bug spotting to improve your ability to perform static code review. The easiest way to go about doing this is to find write-ups and known vulnerabilities, review them, understand them, and then look at the patch that was applied. This is exactly what I was doing about a month ago when I stumbled across something interesting. This research all started when I was searching through NVD for some video game related bugs. I came across two entries from 2020 related to the free and open source game known as Free Droid RPG. The CDEs linked out to a blog post which further gave technical details. Both of the CDEs related to modifying save games in order to achieve some malicious behavior. The first vulnerability was a heap overflow, triggered by the fact that the code would read some of the game data into a fixed sized heap buffer without first checking to make sure it would fit. An attacker could open the save game file, modify the data to be a very large string, and cause an overflow. The second vulnerability was a Lua command injection. One of the save game files was a raw Lua file which would be loaded and run on startup. Modifying this file allowed for an attacker to execute arbitrary code when a save game was loaded. There was some back and forth between the devs and the researchers on the feasibility and the severity of these attacks, but in the end they both ended up receiving a patch. I started looking at these patches when I noticed something weird. Let's start by taking a look at the patch which addressed the Lua remote code execution vulnerability. We can see here that the team decided to implement a Lua sandbox to prevent certain functions from being run. The function which implements this is the newly added Lua restricted open libs. What this does is it creates a white list of functions for each module which it plans to import, such as the IO module and the OS module. Then it loads in each module and it iterates through all of the functions included in them. If the function is not in the white list, it replaces it with a fake function that causes the game to throw an error indicating a blacklisted function has been used. We can see here that the OS whitelist does not include execute, as it's commented out. So running OS execute, as we did in our previous exploit, no longer works. However, let's think critically about the patch applied here. It still gives us the ability to execute code, we're just limited to the functions we can use. Can any of these functions be used in conjunction to bypass the intended constraints of the sandbox? The answer is yes. In particular, the output and write functions can be used in conjunction to achieve an arbitrary file write exploit. Let's break this down a bit. io.output specifies where a write operation takes place. By default, io.write hello will write hello to the terminal, or std out. However, we can change the location by supplying io output with a file name. If the file does not exist, this file will be created, and all subsequent calls to write will be written to the corresponding file. This bypasses the need for us to use the other blacklisted I.O. functions related to reading and writing files. It looks like this may have just been a simple slip up, as we can see output was supposed to be blacklisted, as it's included in the comments where they keep track of the blacklisted functions. Therefore, we can write arbitrary files by changing I.O.output to our preferred location and then writing our data with I.O.write. This primitive isn't as strong as the original code execution, but it breaks the intended functionality and could lead to more severe consequences depending on the target environment. So now that we understand how to bypass the patch for the first phone, let's talk about the heap overflow, which, in my opinion, is much more interesting. In order to understand this vulnerability and its patch, we first need to understand how save games are loaded. Essentially, when a game is saved, FreeDroid creates a large text file and it writes important data to it. Then, when a save game is loaded, that entire text file gets read into memory. The code looks through the saved file for various keywords to know where to start parsing. For example, the function decode waypoints looks through the character array holding the file text for the word WP, 
When it finds this, it knows the next line should hold the waypoints, and so it starts reading from there. When it encounters a new line, it considers that one waypoint has been fully read, and so it saves this one before moving on to the next line. It continues this pattern until it reaches the point where the predefined in string is located, at which point it knows it's read all of the waypoints. The first vulnerability happened due to the fact that decode waypoints trusted that each line would be valid data, and thus had a predefined buffer size of 4096. If an attacker edited one of the waypoints to be extremely long, it would overflow the buffer and cause a crash. However, the developers added the following patch, which attempts to thwart this. We can see that they loop through all of the characters on a line and count how many exist. If it is longer than the expected amount, the function throws an error and exits. Again, let's take a second to think critically about this patch. Does it address the root cause of the vulnerability? The answer is surprisingly yes, but there's another vulnerability lurking here, which leads to the code still having a bug. It's right here in the definition of the nlpos variable. This is a signed value. If you're familiar with vulnerability classes or you read the post on guided hacking, then you may be familiar with integer overflows. The idea is simple. Signed integers have a maximum value. If you exceed that maximum value, the value wraps around to be the minimum value. The reason for why this happens is outside the scope of this video, but check out the post on guided hacking if you're interested in more of the low level details. Looking back at the code now, the new vulnerability becomes obvious. If we create a waypoint that is 32,768 characters long, nlpos will be equal to negative 32,768. This means it will pass the size check and carry on with the rest of the code. Let's take a look at what happens afterwards. We can see that a call to mymalloc takes place with nlpos plus one, and then the data which has been read is mem copied into the newly malloced buffer. Looking at mymalloc, we see one more interesting thing. If the parameter value is equal to zero, it gets auto incremented to one. So if we can get nlpos to be equal to negative one, mymalloc will be called with a value of zero, which will be incremented to one, and we will get a one byte chunk returned. Then on the next line, nlpos is used as the size parameter in memcopy. So the negative one value will be cast to size t, which will convert it to the max integer size. This will result in a huge heap overflow as we're copying the max amount of data possible into a chunk of size one. So can we get nlpos to be equal to negative one? Yes, but it takes a bit more thought because nlpos is also being used as the index into the waypoint array. Thus, when it becomes negative, we're actually reading backwards into the file. In order to account for this, we actually need to craft our payload in a special way. We first need to have 32,766 characters followed by WP. Then on the next line, we need to have 32,768 characters. The decode waypoints function will find the WP string and start reading on the next line. When nlpos overflows, it will become negative 32,768, and thus will be pointing backwards right at our attacker controlled characters. The loop will continue to iterate until it finds a new line character, which will happen after it reads past WP, which we have set up to make nlpos equal to negative one at that time. This results in our expected heap overflow. Here, you see me running the release version of FreeDroid RPG from Steam on Mac OS with our malicious save game data. When the save game is opened, we get a seg fault. Is this bug high impact or exploitable? Not really, but being able to spot it and craft an input to hit it is a skill which will be very beneficial moving into bigger and more high impact targets. Huge shout out to everyone on the FreeDroid RPG team who were very receptive of my report and allowed me to submit two pull requests to address the bugs. These should be coming out in the next release cycle for the game. If you enjoyed this type of own research content, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps me personally to know what to put out next. Also, check out Guided Hacking for hundreds of additional tutorials on Vuln research, reverse engineering, and game hacking. Uh -huh.